Welcome to chapter 24 of the Canadian Securities Course, Volume 2. In this chapter, we are going to be looking at Canadian taxation. So first things first, it is really important to understand the taxation of income and the different types that go along with it. So first, you do have employment income, of, for, of course, just all the uh, income you are earning from your actual job. Then you do have business income, so money you're making from your business, income from property like rent, and then you do have capital gains and losses. So those are the four types of income. Um, and now we'll look at the different tax brackets. So you do have a different tax rates um, and depending on the bracket you are in. So basically on the first $48,535, you will be taxed at 15%. This is in Canada for 2020. So the rates are a bit different. At least the uh, income brackets are a bit different for 2021. Um, now, if you make, let's say $50,000, then the first $48,535 will be taxed at 15%, but that extra $1,500, it will be taxed at the 20.5% rate. So it's not like you move up in a tax bracket, just that portion of income in that tax bracket will be taxed at the tax rate given. So that is really important to understand about the tax brackets. Now we're going to look at the taxation on dividends. This is a bit complicated and it's different than um, basically any other uh, sources of income that uh, you'll be taxed on. So let's say you earn $1,000 of eligible dividends from a Canadian corporation. An eligible dividend basically is just a dividend that you are obtaining from a, a defined eligible Canadian corporation. So for this, you'll actually have a gross up rate, and that's 138%. So if you make $1,000 in an eligible dividend, you actually claim $1,380 as taxable income. Now, although you are claiming more than the $1,000, you do get a dividend tax credit. So the dividend tax credit is 15.02% of the taxable amount of the dividend. So for this example, the $1,380, um, you multiply that by 15.02% and your dividend tax credit is $207.28. So it is important to understand that a dividend tax credit actually just negates um, the tax you are paying. So say you're paying $207, the dividend tax credit completely wipes that and it's a much different than a tax deductible. So it's important to know that difference between tax deductibles and tax credits. But for this example, um, if you are in the uh, federal margin tax rate of 15%, then basically you will be paying $0 of tax on that income. Um, if you are in the 20.5% tax bracket, you're paying $75.62. The 26 bracket is $151.52, um, and so on and so forth. So you can see that the tax rate on the dividend is always much lower than your actual margin tax rate. And that's why dividends are a really great way of earning income. They're better than interest income, since interest is taxed at the full federal marginal rate, um, but they're a bit worse than capital gains since capital gains, only half of it is taxed at the uh, federal marginal rate. Next, we're going to take a look at some tax deductibles. So some acceptable tax deductibles include interest paid on funds borrowed to earn investment income as interest and dividends and do keep in mind this must be in a non-registered account only um, also fees paid for certain investment advice can be acceptable um, fees paid for management administration or safe custody of investments and accounting fees paid for the recording of investment income are acceptable as well now, some not acceptable deductions include interest paid on funds borrowed to buy investments that can only generate capital gains. 
um, brokerage fees or commissions paid to buy or sell securities, interest paid on funds borrowed to contribute to an RRSP, RESP, RDSP, or TFSA. So that's just um, interest on loan funds for that uh, those registered accounts. They are not tax deductible. Um, and any fees for a RIF or self-directed RRSP are not deductible, as, and um, the same with fees paid for financial planning advice. So now we're going to look at capital gains and losses and how they sort of work. So first off, we're going to look at capital gains. So a capital gain is the profit on a sale of a security. And an exception may occur if the investor's intentions are more speculative. So if there's a short period of ownership or special knowledge, um, an exception may occur by the CRA. Um, however, generally it is the profit on a sale of security. Um, and commission is actually included in the cost for the share. Um, so for tax purposes, the settlement date, usually two days after the transaction date, is when the transfer of ownership takes place place um, but if you are purchasing something and there is a uh, commission on it you are going to include it into the cost base um, so your capital gain will actually be a bit less because you're including that um, in terms of the capital loss allowable capital losses are basically 50 percent of the loss on an investment and they can be deducted on a capital gain now, any allowable capital loss that cannot be used in the tax year can be carried back and applied against taxable capital gains in any of the previous three years. And in most cases, they can also be carried forward indefinitely. Now, worthless securities is when a security becomes worthless and the invest investor must then fill out a CRA form electing to declare the security worthless. Also, you, it's really important to understand superficial losses, and these occur when a security is sold at a loss, but then it is repurchased within 30 calendar days before or after the sale and, um, and are still owned. So um, basically, you do not want to repurchase a, a security that you sold at a loss, it will be a superficial loss and these are not tax deductible as a capital loss. Um, so here's just an example of some superficial losses. Uh, basically it is just um, when you sell something for that capital loss and then you buy it back within those 30 days, you cannot claim that capital loss. So next we're going to look at the taxation on accrued interest. Um, so here's an example for this. So say Jared buys $10,000 principal amount of a 5% semi-annual bond at par. He must pay accrued interest of $200 at the time of purchase to the settler, um, which is basically calculated right here. So the seller of the bond includes as investment income for the year $200 accrued interest that was received from the sale and any other interest received as the bond owner during the year. On the same return, the proceeds of disp disposition of $10,000 are used to calculate the capital gain or loss. So the buyer includes as investment income for the year the net interest income of the $300 um, which is basically the $500 of interest, it's a 5% semi-annual bond, um, less the $200 of accrued interest. So that accrued interest does get deducted on the interest income, um, but it does not get deducted for the adjusted cost based uh, when you get a capital gain or capital loss on a sale of a bond. And so next we're gonna look at tax deferral and tax-free plans. So one tax deferral method is using an, a registered pension plan, um, and this is a trust registered with the CRA or appropriate provincial agency. There is two different types. There's the money purchase plan, also the defined contribution pension plan, and there, there is the defined benefits plan or DBPP plan. 
So for the money purchase plan, it is more commonly known as the Divined, uh, Defined Contribution Pension Plan or DCPP. This is a type of registered pension plan where the combined employer or employee contributions cannot exceed 18% of the employee's current year compensation um, or the uh, basically there is a DCPP contribution limit um, and it is indexed with inflation. So the benefit amount at retirement depends on how the contributions are invested over the plan's life but all the money registered into the plan, they're not taxed until you take it out. So that's why you're deferring the tax there. With the defined benefit pension plan, the benefit amount is predetermined based on a formula that considers years of service, income level, and other variables. The contribution limit is the lesser of 9% of the employee's compensation for the year, or $1,000 plus $70 of their pension adjustment for the year. Now you also have the RRSP or Registered Retirement Savings Plan. This is another method to defer taxes. So RRSPs, they accumulate tax-free as long as it remains in the investment account. So any withdrawals from an RRSP is treated as regular income and it will be taxed in the year of, that the withdrawal is made. Um, now, when you are con contributing to RRSPs, um, say your taxable income is fifty thousand, and you decide to contribute ten thousand to an RRSP, um, you will get a tax slip back, and you'll be able to deduct that from your taxable income. So, if you put ten thousand into your RRSP, your taxable income will decrease by ten thousand, um, and you'll only have to pay taxes on four thousand or forty thousand dollars of taxable income. But uh, also with RRSPs, you do have single vendor plans and self-directed plans. The single vendor plans, this is when the holder invests in one or more um, securities, basically. Um, and then investments are held in trust under the plan by a particular issuer. And the holders do not make the day-to-day -day investment decisions. Whereas there's also self-directed plans where the holders invest or contribute certain accept acceptable assets. Um, and they do um, do it themselves, and the plans are usually administered for a fee. Now, you also have qualified and non-qualified RRSP investments. Um, basically, you just know the distinction between the two. Qualified is um, sort of just securities or investments, whereas non-qualified is um, physical, uh, physical items or physical things. Um, such as real estate, commodity, property, um, and shares and debt obligations for private corporations. So the RRSP contributions, um, I sort of did go over this a little bit, but the maximum annual tax deductible contribution is the lesser of either 18% of the previous year's earned income or the RRSP dollar limit for the year. Um, you'll also want to minus the previous year's pension adjustment and the current year's um, PSPA. Now, the RRSP limit is indexed with inflation. It was 27230 in 2020, um, and in individuals can carry forward the unused contribution limits indefinitely. Um, now, RRSPs, a few more rules about them. So, earned income for the RRSPs in order to calculate the amount of contribution room you will be obtaining. You use employment income and net rental income, royalties and research grants, disability payments, uh, maintenance payments ordered by a court, CPP, and EI. There is a penalty for over-contributing -con to a uh, RRSP. So plan holders whose contributions to RSPs exceed their limit will be imposed a 1% penalty for any portion of over contributions that exceeds $2,000. You can also make contributions in kind, and this is when a plan holder contributes securities they already own to an RRSP. And according to the CRA, this is a deemed disposition, so the investor must claim any capital gains on the transfer 
and the investment assumes a cost base equal to the market value at the time of the transaction. Now there's also some rules when withdrawing from an RRSP. So withdrawals are subject to withholding tax and it does depend on the amount withdrawn. Um, so if basically if you withdraw up to uh, $5,000, so $5,000 or less, then you will have to withdraw 10% of federal tax for all provinces except Quebec, because Quebec has their own rules. Um, and then with um, the 5,001 to 15,000, the withholding tax is 20%, and over 15,000, it is 30%. So the holder must include in their ta income tax the amount withdrawn in the year of withdrawal, and that does include the portion for the withholding tax. Now we're going to look at spousal RRSPs. So, so it's sort of another type of RRSP and the contributions made, they're deducted on the income tax of the person contributing. And once it is withdrawn, it is taxable on the spouse. So you'll use, you'll use this if you have a spouse. One spouse will contribute to it. They'll get that tax deduction. Um, and it will be the other spouse's RRSP then, or spousal RRSP. And whenever they withdraw from it, they will have to claim that income. So basically, it's a way of splitting income between partners, um, and it is helpful for tax purposes. Now, there is a bit of an exception here. So if the contribution was made in the year the funds were withdrawn, or within two calendar years prior to the year of withdrawal, the withdrawal is considered taxable to the contributor. So say you have um, a husband and wife here, um, and the husband is contributing $1,000 to his wife's uh, spousal RSP. So he will be claiming that tax deduction, but in the seventh year, um, he doesn't make a contribution, um, and then she starts withdrawing from it. Um, so say they went on a trip and she withdrew the money. Uh, basically, uh, the money withdrawn um, up to three years ago, it will be taxable in the wife's name, but all the uh, in, all the income that was contributed to it um, this year or two calendar calendar years prior, it will be taxable to the husband, the contributor of the spousal RSP. Um, now, also with uh, termination of an RSP. So once the plan holder reaches age 71 in that year, they will have the following options alone or in combination, but basically they will have to get rid of their RRSP since it's meant for retirement. So once that person reaches age 71, basically the government just wants them to start withdrawing on that and using it as a retirement income. So your options include withdrawal the proceeds as a lump sum payment, and this is fully taxable in the year of receipt. It's basically never done. It's not advised at all since you will get a large tax bill. Um, it would only be done if your RRSP is quite small. The other option is to use the proceeds to purchase a life annuity. This is only useful if interest rates are quite high. Right now, they're too low, so you're actually losing money um, by purchasing a life annuity. The third option is use the proceeds to purchase a fixed term annuity. Again, just annuities are not good right now with low interest rates. Um, and the final option is to transfer the proceeds to a RIF or Registered Retirement Income Fund, um, which you can provide an annual income from it. Basically, it's the same thing as, our, as an RRSP except you have a minimum percentage of the income that you need to withdraw per year. And you'll need to start doing that in your uh, age 72 year. So uh, also if the plan holder dies before the age of 71, the beneficiary may transfer the proceeds free of tax into their own RRSP. And if there is no beneficiary or the proceeds are not transferred into an RRSP, then they are taxed on the deceased person's income in the year of death. So there are some pros and cons to RRSPs. First off, the tax deductible contributions, they can reduce taxable income during high earning years. 
Um, there's certain types of lump sum income that can be transferred into an RRSP and it can be sheltered from tax. It will grow um, tax free and you'll have that compounding on that deferred tax amount. So that's a really big pro to RRSPs. Another pro is savings for future retirement can earn compound interest on that tax free basis until withdrawn. Basically, um, what I just said. Also, you have income taxes can be deferred until later years, um, and spouses can split their retirement income to lower taxation of the combined income, and they can claim uh, $2,000 of pension tax credits. That's only if they are withdrawing from a RIF or a registered retirement income fund. Now, the cons of RRSP is, is that the plan holder pays income tax on the entire amount withdrawn, not just the capital gains. And that's because you are, um, when you're contributing to it, you are getting that money back basically on your taxes. You're lowering your taxable income. So all of the money is not taxed. And therefore, when you do withdraw all of it, it all must be taxed. Um, also, the plan holder, they cannot take advantage of the dividend tax credit on eligible shares um, because basically all the income is going to be uh, taxed the same, just as regular old taxable income. So it doesn't matter if you're making in income from dividends, interest, capital gains, it's all the same in an RRSP. Now, if the plan holder dies, all the payments out of the RRSP to the, uh, goes to the plan holder's estate. Um, and they are subject to tax as income of the deceased. And this is unless they have been transferred to the beneficiary's RRSP. So basically, whenever that income is coming out of this RRSP or even the beneficiary's RRSP, it is going to be taxed. And the assets of an RRSP cannot be used as collateral for a loan. So now we're going to quickly look at Registered retirement income funds or RIFs um, and the features here is that in the year after the RIF is acquired and in each following year the plan holder must withdraw a fraction of the total assets in the RIF and this is considered taxable on your income tax. So that's the only difference from a RIF um, to a RRSP and this is going to be what you're going to be basically putting your money into when you do turn age 71. Now, as a general rule of thumb, the percentage that must be withdrawn is equal to one divided by 90 minus the age. Um, this is sort of an estimate. So it isn't always the number that you will get out of this calculation, but it is a pretty cool, good rule to go off of. Now we're going to look at deferred annuities. So deferred annuities, they give the holder regular payments over a specified amount of time. And contributions to a deferred annuity, they're not tax deductible. The annuitant is taxed only on the interest element of the annuity payments. And should the annuitant die, benefits can be transferred to the annuitant's spouse. Otherwise, the value of any remaining benefits must be included in the deceased's income in the year of death. Now, deferred annuities, they are available only through life insurance companies, and they're not really um, something that is used much nowadays with low interest rates. So I'm going to be going over tax-free savings accounts now. This is going to be a bit of an overview of them. They are extremely useful um, and they're a bit different from RRSPs. So a TFSA, it is a savings vehicle that came into ex existence in 2009 and income earned within a TFSA is not taxed in any way throughout the holder's lifetime. So any resident of Canada who is at least 18 years old can open a TFSA. It does depend on the um, the age of uh, majority, uh, when you can sign off on something, it depends on that for each specific province. But uh, in Canada, you will start accumulating room at age 18. So your contribution limits will increase yearly and they are indexed with inflation. And as you can see, if you never started a TFSA and you were 18 before 2009, your uh, annual contribution limit would have been 69500 as of 2020. 
but as of 2021, it is now uh, another $6,000 higher, so $75,500. Now, with the TFSA withdrawals, um, it is important to understand this. So, say you have someone who has no more contribution room left and they decide to withdraw uh, $10,000 then you won't actually get that room back until the following year. So when the following year comes, say the uh, maximum increase by 6,000, then you'll get your 10,000 back that you withdrew from that following year, and you'll get that 6,000. So you do have to wait the year after you withdraw it before you get that room back. Now we're gonna look at registered education savings plans. Um, these are tax deferred savings plans intended to help pay for the post-secondary education of a beneficiary. And lifetime contributions allowed is $50,000 per beneficiary. Contributions can be made for up to 31 years, but the plan must be collapsed within 35 years of its starting date. And there's two different types. You have pooled RESPs and self-directed RESPs. Also, more than one beneficiary can be named, and this is considered a family plan. And if one of the named beneficiaries does not pursue post-education, all of the income can be directed to the beneficiary who does attend. Now, as I mentioned, you have two different types. You have pooled RESPs, and these allow various subscribers to make contributions for their beneficiaries whereas the um, self-directed uh, RESPs, um, they're administered by various financial institutions and contributions tend to be much more flexible and uh, the contributors can participate in both investment and distribution decisions, um, which is a bit different from the pooled RESPs since they're managed by the plan administrators and the administrators determine the amount paid out to beneficiaries. So RESPs, um, the contributor can uh, withdraw the income if the plan has been in existence for more than 10 years and none of the named beneficiaries has started qualified post-secondary programs by the age of 21. The other way is a bit morbid, it's if all the named beneficiaries have died. Now if the beneficiaries do not attend qualifying programs, Contributors are allowed to transfer a maximum of $50,000 of RESP income to their RRSPs if they have enough contribution room. And no taxes are charged when, uh, when withdrawn, but revenues earned are taxed at the con contributor's tax level, plus an additional penalty of 20% tax. Now, when you are contributing to an RESP, you do get a government grant. So for all families, if you're contributing 2,500, a maximum of this, you will get 20% of a government grant. So they'll give you 500 bucks and it will be a total of $3,000 and that's the maximum per year per beneficiary. So say you invest uh, $1,000 in your RESP for a year, you'll get $200 of a government grant to add on to it. Now, if you are a family that is earning under $48,535, first tax bracket, um, then you will get an extra $100. So basically, um, on the first $500, you'll get that extra $100. Um, so it will turn your, uh, your total amount into $600. And then if you're in between the first and second tax bracket um, for family income, you'll get 10% uh, additional on the uh, first 500. Um, so that's pretty good as well. Now we're gonna look at pooled registered pension plans. Um, so this is a type of retirement savings plan offered by the federal government, and it's designed to address the gap in employer pension plan coverage. So these uh, PRPPs, they hold assets pooled by multiple participation employers, and allow workers to take advantage of lower investment management costs that result from pooling investments. Now they are open to workers in the three territories and those who work in a federal regulated business and choose to participate in this plan and those who live in a province that uh, has the legislation in place. Um, and a lot like an RRSP where contributions are tax deductible, 
um, and there is a limit available to the contribution room. Now to cap off this chapter, I do have some tax planning strategies that were uh, listed in the textbook. First off is splitting income. So splitting income, it is a tax saving strategy and it involves transferring income in a high tax bracket to a spouse, child, or parent in a low tax bracket. And doing so allows the same income to be taxed at a lower rate. Now transferring income is another tax planning strategy. If property or income producing assets are transferred from the taxpayer to other family members, the tax consequences may be passed back to the taxpayer. Paying expenses is another way, so the higher income spouse should pay all the family expenses first, while the lower income spouse should invest as much income as practical. Making loans when an investment can be expected to generate earnings in excess of the prescribed rate on the loan it is often worthwhile for the higher income family member to loan funds to a lower income family member. This will allow the excess of the investment earnings over the interest charged is effectively transferred to the person in the lower tax bracket. And discharging debts. So the lower income person can borrow money from a third party and the person with the higher income can repay the loan without triggering attribution rules. Uh, sharing CPP. So if you're uh, people who are at least 60 years old and you're collecting CPP. CPP can be shared among spouses to capitalize on shifting more to the spouse with the lower tax bracket. And gifting. A taxpayer may choose to transfer investments to adult children by way of gift, and such gifts result in a deemed disposition at fair market value by the person who made the gift. And so anyway, those are all the most important concepts in this chapter of the Canadian Securities course. It's probably one of the largest chapters, but it is quite important to understand. And I'm sure if you are working towards being an advisor, you will get a lot of tax questions. So it's something that you really do need to know. Now, as always, I really hope you did enjoy this video and recap of the chapter and stay tuned for the next chapter.